through this, uh, these numbers. It's better than the market had expected. What was the standout? I have a sneaking suspicion it's an energy trading. Can you confirm that? So, thank you. Good morning. We, we've had a great start to the year. So, our income is up 9% in the first quarter. And in fact, on an underlying basis, that's the best print we've had for about seven years. Um, our underlying profit was up 5%. And our capital ratios and our capital returns were also very, very strong. And so we've actually upgraded our guidance for the full year. Um, underpinning that very strongly is the performance we've had in the financial markets. So the rates and FX business with all the volatility that has been out there, they have had a bumper quarter. And that is more than offset the slight weakness in the wealth management space. So overall, a really, really strong start to the year. Very, very encouraged by it. Andy, I, I do have to wonder, given that a lot of this is due to volatility in financial markets around the war in Ukraine, are these the type of results that can be repeated? Well, the volatility, I don't think, is going away anytime soon. Now, whether it will be at the same heightened levels as we saw, um, particularly over the last few weeks, particularly in the month of March, I guess, you know, it's probably debatable. But our sense is that that volatility is likely to be there for quite a period of time. And hence why we've said the full year outturn for us looks pretty promising. With HSBC, they said that they had a turbo charge uh, to deliver for the market in terms of rates. Do you have a turbocharger in terms of rates expectation for the bottom line for Standard Chartered, Andy? You've often complained that you were suffering in a low rate env environment. What is your turbocharger, Ferrari? <laughs> Um, well, whether it's Ferrari, Lamborghini, I don't know. But um, um, yes, yeah, cer <laughs> certainly rates is, is really, really, really helpful for us. Um, the last two years has been abnormally low rates, as we all know, and that's been very difficult. Um, prior to COVID, the US rates are sort of like 2% just above, and now seeing that forward curve go up to 2 and indeed maybe 3%. Um, and in part, that's why we've said that uh, our target of getting our returns up to 10% by 2024. You know, there's an outside chance we could get there a bit earlier if the rates curve does hold up so at Andy, the current level. So you say it's going to benefit you, but put some numbers on it. How much is going to benefit you? UBS says $1 billion. Credit Suisse said it would benefit them $150 million if we get the Fed going the full Monty. And What's your too, figure? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we have said that over the next two or three years, as we came down the curve um, on rates, it probably cost us about $2 billion on our top line. And seeing those rates curve revert back to where they were previously, we see no reason why we shouldn't see the thick end of that coming back into our numbers over the next couple of years. Uh, the natural corollary to that then is buyback. HSBC were gloomy on the buyback. It, it's an aggressive upsum, but they weren't promising, uh, you know, a glass half full. With everything you've just said to us, will you push forward? Will you upgrade your guidance on mm -hmm. buybacks? What narrative on dividend and buybacks can you give to the market this morning? So we are mid-flow in a $750 million buyback program. We're about 80% of the way through it. So that obviously we'll run through, that will complete in the next few weeks. We said in February that over the next three years, we intend to return at least $5 billion. That will be buybacks and dividends over the three year period. And that is continuing to be our focus. So the 750 is the start of that. And over a period of time, we'll have the dividend coming next. And we'll look at the buyback potential in a particular each half year end to decide what is appropriate. But that is very central to getting our returns up, is returning capital to shareholders. Andy, one thing which Danny and I are looking at are your financial markets revenue. It, obviously, a very comfortable beat. I said it to you at the start. It looked like it was commodity trading more than doubled. I, you're benefiting from volatility. Um, is that to do with energy and commodity trading? Uh, I mean, is that where this big beat comes from? So our commodities performance has been very strong, as you say. Um, part of that is energy, part of that is minerals. 
and bearing in mind where we are present in the world, the clients we have got, commodities has always been a reasonable part um, of our portfolio. And in previous years, people have been concerned on the downside when commodity prices have been low. We're now in a period when commodity prices are higher, and clearly that has benefited us during the period. Andy, one perhaps rough point in the quarter was wealth management down 17 percent, Hong Kong down 26 percent. Given zero COVID in China, given the volatility in general in Asia, are you seeing clients who are fearful, who are just sitting this out? So overall, <clears throat> if you go back over about a 10-year period, we've had a great run on the wealth management. Um, this first quarter has been more tricky. About a third of our global income and wealth management is in the Hong Kong region. And two things really happened in the quarter. The first was COVID spiked and people were not able to get outside their homes, etc. And that obviously reduced some of the sales activity we had. And secondly, with the markets being very turbulent, it did cause a number of our clients and clients elsewhere, I think, just to be more cautious about the market. So overall, we were about 100 million lower on our income in wealth management than we were a year ago, albeit at fairly similar levels to the levels we've had in the last two or three quarters. I think going forward, seeing now progressively Hong Kong pouring out of the COVID situation, that will be helpful. Market sentiment, as you said before, uh, came on, I think is starting to pick up. So hopefully over the period of the next few quarters, we'll start to see that rebuilding. Andy, we can't let you go. These markets are moving uh, aggressively. Bonds, the biggest losses on record this month. Dollar yen, look at it now, 130.10. It's broken 130. Yuan's on a trashing mission. These devaluations in these currencies, what's the risk? How does it translate for you? Well, I think for us, the volatility on currency is generally good. Our clients often looking to hedge their positions, and we will facilitate that. Clearly, the big question is, what does this do overall to volumes of demand globally? At the moment, they're holding up in our region, um, but obviously, we remain vigilant on that front. But overall, we've been really pleased with the start of this year. I mean, again, we still have seen bank after bank warn of material deleveraging in Asia. And part of it is this story, Andy, this, this concern, this scare over the economy, over interest rate differentials. What do you do to avoid that scenario? Are enough buffers in place to avoid any form of exodus? Yes, I think so. We, we operate in a large number of markets. We're in around 60 countries around the world. And um, that actually gives us a broad sort of spread across different ge geographies. Um, overall, as I say, demand is still holding up. We had increases in our uh, lending to customers, our exposures to customers on an underlying basis um, in the last few months. But um, I, I think we should step back to the bank overall. The rates being higher, uh, per your earlier question, really is a very key thing here. And even if there's a bit of softening of demand, the rate support will be considerable. So, so but outflows, Andy, is that, is that, are we expecting that to come from China? Well, I think in China, whilst the GDP outlook expectations have been lowered slightly, our business is much more focused upon sort of cross-border trade. And therefore, it's actually more the level of export and import activity that affects us. And that has been very, very strong over recent quarters. So we continue to be very positive about uh, China as a region, uh, our business in China. And um, we will continue to do everything we can to help our clients to, you know, to navigate the changes that are going on. The underlying volume of activity there is still strong. Andy, there was one closing line in your, in your statement, which was on real estate. HSBC said it was too soon to call an end to the pain in commercial property. You've taken another, another line today. Is, is that pain done? Are we at the end of that cycle? Are you concerned that there could be a more material shift lower in the commercial property cycle in China? So we, we, we obviously keeping a close eye on it. It's not fully gone through its cycle, but I think we are a large way through it. So hopefully over the next few quarters that will fully settle down. Um, but overall, it's one sector in a very big portfolio that we've got. We've taken some reserves on it, not huge reserves. But we have taken some reserves and hopefully over the next few quarters we'll see that settle.